All right, so last week we, we looked at Jesus' death, um, and then today we will look at, as, at his resurrection and ascension. So last week I left you all on a cliffhanger. Jesus had died. What, what happens next? Where's the, where's the resolution? Where's the, where's the happy ending? But we know that that's not the end. Uh, we know that he only stayed in the tomb temporarily. Um, and, then, and then we'll get to that. But I want to start off where we finished off last time, looking at, at the example and the, the picture of Isaac and Abraham. Um, and so Isaac was a willing sacrifice, and the father gave him willingly um, in obedience to, to God. And we might find that strange since God had told Abraham that Isaac would be the child of promise. Um, and indeed, he was that child of promise. So he would be the line that would lead to Christ. But Abraham was willing to kill Isaac as a show of faith, not only in obedience to God in his command, but in faith that Isaac would be the child of promise even if he did die. In, a, in essence, believing that God would raise him from the dead and still fulfill his promise. So we see this in Hebrews 11, 17 to 19, uh, where the Holy Spirit says, By faith Abraham... When he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the, in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. And since Jesus was the only begotten from the Father, the only son, the one whom God's children would be named, Christians, the father offered him up as a willing sacrifice, knowing full well that he would rise from the dead and indeed giving him that power to rise from the dead because he is of the same essence and nature of God. He is another person of the Trinity. And this is the beginning of that fulfillment of the prophecy to Abraham. Through your offspring shall all the nations be blessed. So that's as an intro, and we'll get into some of the narrative elements of the resurrection of Christ. So just as with the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ is mentioned in all of the four Gospels. Uh, clearly, it's a pivotal point in, in all of history. Uh, it all turns on the death and resurrection of Christ. So all Gospels need to mention that it's not just a, a dead hope that we have, it's hope that's alive and continues to, to live. And like last week, there are key passages outside of the Gospels as well that give us different perspectives and a greater clarity on, on these things that are not just within the narrative, but they're also outside. Uh, and one of these significant passages is 1 Corinthians 15. And I'll read uh, the first 22 verses. Obviously, the whole chapter talks about the resurrection, but I'll, I'll just limit it to the first 22 verses. So 1 Corinthians 15 uh, from verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, then he appeared, appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then also to the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church. 
But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, and by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. So we'll leave it there for now. Um, and obviously, yeah, Paul, as I said, Paul goes on to talk about the resurrection for the rest of the chapter. Um, but we'll leave it into uh, leave it to Paul to, to say that, and I'll get into um, the resurrection. So regarding Christ's resurrection, there are three main things that are key to understanding it, and they come from the narrative uh, and also from this passage uh, that we just read. Um, and those are... Uh, it is predicted, it is powerful, and it is proof. Uh, so we'll get into the, the narrative now before we uh, go into those in some detail. So Jesus was buried in the tomb just after he died uh, in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And the scribes and the Pharisees, despite seeing him die, they didn't believe um, that he would raise from the dead, but they needed to safeguard other people trying to make make it as if he had, raised, had been raised from the dead because they knew that he'd said that he would rise from the dead. So they talked to Pilate and they made sure that there was a guard at the tomb and they sealed the tomb as well as that just to make sure that nothing was happening. This, however, didn't stop anything because on the early on the third day, that was on the Sunday, the first day of the week. Before dawn, there was a great earthquake, and the guards were terrified and were like dead men because of the angel that rolled away the stone. They knew what had happened. They saw it. They were terrified and struck down as if they were dead from it. And yet they still went back to the chief priests and the scribes. But they, just like the false witnesses, in the trial that I talked about last week, they were paid off to make sure that their true testimony would stay hidden and they wouldn't uh, propagate the truth. So despite the clear indication that Jesus not only did miracles, but he had been raised from the dead from this testimony, the Pharisees' hearts were still so hardened that they could not believe that he had been raised from dead or that he was who he said he was. So that's, that's one side of it, but then the other side of it is the apostles and the followers of Jesus. So Mary Magdalene, along with some of the other women, were the first to the tomb because they wanted to embalm Jesus and bring all these herbs uh, to make sure that his body was, was taken care of after the Sabbath. But they found the tomb empty, and there was an angel there instead declaring that Jesus had risen and that he would be with them in Galilee. The other Gospels uh, add some more details to this account, like Peter and John running to the tomb, and John even says that he outruns Peter, but Peter's still is bold enough to go inside the tomb and check for himself. 
So they wanted to check the, the account of the women. They wanted to see for themselves in any case. And they too saw angels and they believed, but they were dumbfounded. They still didn't truly understand what this meant. And then slowly but surely, Jesus continued to reveal himself as the risen Christ uh, to all his disciples in a new, resurrected, but recognizable body. Jesus, not only by his appearance, declared himself to be God as having the power over death, his own death, but he also clearly explained from the scriptures that he was the Messiah that was promised. He did this on the road to Emmaus, as recorded in Luke, with a couple of the disciples, and then he did this over a period of 40 days to the disciples while he was still with them. So he did this before his ascension so that he would greater equip the disciples to, to know for sure and to understand from the Old Testament as well that, that Jesus was the Christ and so that they could fulfill the rest of uh, the ministry that he had uh, made them to do or commanded them to do. And then one of the most significant uh, post-resurrection declarations of who Jesus is uh, comes from Thomas. Uh, after, after seeing, after all the other disciples seeing Jesus and believing, Thomas then, who wasn't with them at the time, when he sees him and he sees the scars in his hands and on his feet and on his side, he says, my Lord and my God, saying that he is truly uh, God and that he is truly raised from the dead. So we'll get into uh, these three items here. So it is predicted, first of all. So after Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, essentially when he, he starts off and he, it's the first time that Jesus is declared as to be the Messiah by his disciples, Jesus says, okay, well, he doesn't say this, but he, the way that we can infer that his, his mind works is like, all right, these people know who I am now. Now my task is to go toward the cross. He set his face toward Jerusalem, toward the cross, but he didn't just talk about the cross from that point on. He also talked about his resurrection. Even immediately after that confession um, in Matthew 16, uh, he says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Jesus predicted that he would be three days and three nights in the earth. Uh, this was what he called the, the sign of Jonah. And this was immediately after when he would ask uh, the the scribes and the Pharisees asked for a sign, and he said, no sign will be given to you except for the sign of Jonah. And that's yeah, three days and three nights in the earth, speaking of his death and resurrection. He also said that he would destroy the temple in referring to himself, and that he would raise it up in three days. That's in John 2. And there are many other times that Jesus specifically predicted his death and resurrection inclusive of several metaphors of death bringing life, uh, such as John 12, 23 and 24, when he says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And then Jesus even called himself the resurrection and the life. So not only did he predict his own death and resurrection, but he called himself the resurrection. How much more uh, prediction do you need than when you call yourself the resurrection? So not only did he predict his own death and resurrection, but it's also predicted from the Old Testament as well. And I've only got a couple of uh, examples here, but one of those is, is Psalm 16.10. When it's talking about the Messiah, it says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. 
So he did not start to decay. He was raised to life. And then in Isaiah 53, it alludes to Christ's resurrection, just as it talked about his death. So it says that he shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his days, talking about the servant of the Lord, which is Christ, and divide the spoil with the strong. So clearly one who is dead cannot see their own offspring, nor divide the spoil with those who are more than conquerors with him. This also is the fulfillment of the promises to Abraham, to Adam, and to David. So this is the, the one who has crushed the serpent's head with the only weapon of the serpent being death, and death is now conquered. And Jesus is the one who will sit on the Davidic throne for eternity as he will remain alive post-resurrection into uh, eternity. So that leads into our, our next point, that Christ's resurrection is powerful. So the resurrection shows to everyone that what Christ has done was successful, that death could not hold him, and that he was the firstborn among many brothers. And all who would believe would receive a resurrection body just as he did. He is the son of the woman who would crush the serpent's head, reverse the curse. The ultimate effect of the curse was that death came into the world. And then the result of the resurrection was that that was the start of that reversal. Slowly at first, because only Christ was raised, but it applied to our spiritual lives, us being able to be raised from the dead spiritually, and then eventually um, to be glorified and receive those resurrection bodies. And that's why Jesus is called the firstborn of the resurrection among many brothers. He was only the first to be resurrected, but it would go to all believers. And this is why Paul states uh, in relation to the, the spiritual aspect of that in Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So the power that raised him from the dead is now in us, allowing us to be in obedience to Christ, to actually live for him instead of being stuck in our sins and being only able to, to sin more and more. So earlier in Romans Paul declares that Christ's resurrection was for our justification as well. So not only is the sacrifice acceptable for God for our transgressions, but all those united to Christ are considered righteous and justified, no longer dead, but alive in him. And if we are alive in him being justified, we are also being sanctified, being made like Christ, and then we'll be glorified because Paul declares that, that chain cannot be broken in Romans 8 as well. And all this, all this is only possible because of the death and resurrection of Christ. And this is what the picture of baptism is. It represents death to self, death to sinfulness, and the deeds of the flesh, and then being raised with Christ so that we may live through faith according to the commands of the Lord. So we see that the resurrection is powerful, powerful enough to reverse what Adam's sin had done by bringing life, new life, to all who would call on Christ's name. So the last one on Christ's resurrection is that it is proof. So the resurrection proves that our God is not dead. And this is evidenced by what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, as we read, that Jesus was seen by more than 500 witnesses after the resurrection. And just a short digression from that, but that seeing that so many people had seen him at one time and then they followed on in obedience to Christ from that, from one standpoint, it's a statistical impossibility that so many people would be able to keep up that facade. 
have the same story, have the same uh, experience of a truly changed life. There would be no, pr- there'd be no reason to keep up that facade or pretense of Christ rising from the dead if it did not actually happen. There'd be no reason at all that people would be persecuted and eventually martyred for their faith if they had not believed with full conviction and seen him in the flesh. Uh, God says, or Jesus says to, to Thomas when he says, my Lord and my God, Jesus says, you have seen and believed. Blessed are those who believe yet and yet have not seen. So Paul goes on to mention that there'd be no benefit to a follower of Christ afterward if he had not raised, been raised from the dead. So no incentive or reason to keep up that, um, that belief um, if they were believing in a God who was still dead, if there was no power, no real power in it. Even in the narrative of the resurrection, there are several things that prove that this could not have been falsified as well. So he was supernatural and clearly indicated as such. There was a stone that was rolled away, not a stone that any human could come up, as in if they came up with a mob of people and overwhelmed the guards and broke the seal and moved the... seems the guards would have reported that if that was the case. But they reported that an angel had and an earthquake, something only God can do, had moved away the stone and made it empty. So not only that God has power over death in resurrection being himself, the resurrection, but it's only possible for us then to participate in the resurrection and having new life because he has been raised from the dead. We only have new life in him because he is life and he is not dead. So if indeed he has been raised from the dead. And going back to 1 Corinthians 15 again, uh, in verse 17, Paul says, And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And this is where we see the proof of the resurrection. It's the new life in believers, changed lives, and they're permanently changed lives. They're not changed for a time, although some may appear that way, but the ones who are saved continue on that upward journey of sanctification because they, are, they do have new life in him. Uh, so that's, that's the resurrection. It's predicted, it's powerful, and it is proof to us that God is alive, that he has been raised, and that what we believe is true. So that leads us into our next next one, and Christ's ascension. So Christ's ascension is officially recorded in Luke's Gospel um, and in Luke's second volume, The Acts of the Apostles. It's unofficially recorded in, in Mark 16, um, but that was likely added, added later as it lacks some of the uh, other things that are necessary or not in the earlier manuscripts, at least. Um, but it is interesting to note that Matthew, Mark, and John um, don't specifically mention the ascension. Um, but it is alluded to in them because Jesus said that he did need to go away. He did say that he would, ra- he would be raised and he would go away for a time and then come back. But then he also said that he would depart from them and leave them uh, to complete the work uh, that he had for them. So he said that he would send another of the same kind to them, and that being the Holy Spirit. So that giving them the power that they needed to actually complete the task that they need to do. The main detail of the the ascension, however, is only recorded in Acts. It's very only briefly recorded in Luke, um, 
but Luke, as he wrote both volumes, um, he would have just directed to, to the second part, to the first chapter of Acts. Uh, and this is the details of what we read in Acts, that Jesus went, to the, went with the disciples to the Mount of Olives, and then he gives them the Great Commission, declaring that they had to fulfill the work of the gospel. And then after giving them encouragement and saying to them that they should wait for the arrival of the Holy Spirit, he then departs from them into the sky. And while the disciples are still staring into the sky, angels come and they're standing beside them and looking up and looking at the disciples and saying, why are you still looking up to the sky? You've got work to do, essentially. He will come back in the same way. And that's, that's the preview, that's the, the first teaser um, of what Andrew will talk about uh, in, in Revelation. So Christ's ascension, um, there are three main points that I want to bring out in this as well. And the first is the commission. This is the, the last thing that he, he wanted to convey to the disciples. He sends the apostles and disciples out to proclaim the gospel to all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So progressively from where they're at and progressively outward um, to the rest of the world. And it's not that this wasn't already communicated to the disciples throughout Jesus' ministry, but this is the, the final and purposeful specific commission of what they were to do. So that if they were to remember anything, it would be what he said after his resurrection when he was explaining who he was from the, the, the Old Testament and also that this is now your task, to proclaim what I have done so that everyone may believe. So it's also mentioned... Um, in a less specific sense in, in some of the other Gospels, when, when in John 21, Jesus says to, to Peter, do you love me? Says, yes, Lord, I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. And he says it three times. So this is to say that there is something that you need to do after I go away, and that's to, to provide um, for the sheep, to feed the sheep that, that Jesus has given to the disciples to care for. And that's essentially through the word of the gospel. And this gospel has been granted new life over death, del delivered them from the penalty and the power of sin. So it's an effective message that they're given. It's not something without power, because all power and all authority has been given to me, <coughs> Uh, being Christ, and he's then giving that in his commission to the disciples. And then after this commission is given, Jesus departs from them and then goes into the clouds. So another aspect of the commission that we, um, or not the commission, the ascension that's uh, necessary is that it shows the completion of Jesus' work, of his earthly ministry. In Jesus' leaving, he left alive. It's significantly different, different from having him die again on earth at an old age or continue his ministry post-resurrection. Uh, that simply wouldn't happen because that wasn't God's plan. His plan was that he would spend a time of transition with them, with the disciples, equipping them, making sure that they were capable and um, yeah, equipped to do the work of the ministry to share the gospel. But it shows that his work is complete. And then he ascends to, the, to heaven and then he sits on the right hand of the Father. So that's the, the place of power and authority, able to judge and also intercede for us as he continues to do. And there is even a witness of the ascended Christ in Stephen's vision in Acts 7, saying that Jesus is at the right hand of God. So it's, again, showing that what Jesus had done on earth was enough um, for what he had needed to do. It was complete. 
in terms of what he needed to do on earth. That was, that was sufficient. And we can only trust in the death and resurrection of Christ because we know that what he had done was enough and that he could leave the disciples to do the rest of the work. He didn't need to, to coach them, to guide them, to go one by one to every single believer who would be saved and say, look, I am Jesus, I have been living for X number of years. Um, but it was sufficient, it was enough for his earthly ministry at that point. And then he gave it over to the disciples so that they could do their work. And then the last one uh, is the counsellor. Christ's ascension gives way for Christ to send another member of the Trinity down to the people of God, the Holy Spirit. And this is so that they could actually carry out the work that Christ had commanded them to do, had commissioned them to do. If it were not for Christ leaving earth, the Holy Spirit would have not been able to come down and indwell the believers in the same way, working in their hearts, enabling them to write scripture and for us to faithfully read and interpret scripture. And more than that, actually carry out the things that are contained within scripture. He gives us the ability to obey the commands that he has. The Holy Spirit living in us gives us the same power that Jesus had. Not in the same way, but in the way that it gives us life and power over sin in our lives. And the Holy Spirit also acts as a seal for our salvation, giving us that assurance that the work of Christ is sufficient for us, that we may have confidence in his work and what he has done. So there you have it. That's a very quick run through of some of the necessary things to understand from Christ's resurrection and his ascension. So it shows that I wanted to highlight that his resurrection was predicted. It wasn't something that wasn't anticipated throughout the rest of scripture. It was powerful, powerful enough to give us life um, in the bodies of our of our own sinfulness, and it is proof. And then his ascension gave the Great Commission. It shows us that his work on earth was complete and then can be carried out by the disciples and that the Holy Spirit can now come and complete the work that he started through the disciples. And then next week, Andrew will continue from, from this point on um, starting with Acts, uh, with the next signpost, which is church and commission, uh, starting with the church's witness, essentially immediately after the um, Christ's resurrection. That's all, but I'll, I'll pray um, before we get into some questions. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word again. Uh, we thank you that it is clear. We thank you that as we read the four Gospels, we see that you had a ministry that was effective. It showed your power over death, over disease, over the, the effects of the curse. But the ultimate reversal of that curse was through your death and resurrection. It not only gave yourself new life, but it enabled us that all who believe in your name can have new life that we can have power over sin, that we can believe in you and accept your commands as truth because you have shown us the proof of your resurrection. You have been raised from the dead. And Lord, we, we thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit, that you did not leave us uh, by ourselves without any help. You gave us the Spirit to empower us, to enlighten us, and to convict us of the, the wrong we continue to do and to assure us of our salvation, to seal us of the day um, of your coming. We pray these things in your blessed name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.